Hey everybody, what up? Um, this video, so it's been about a year and a half almost since ChatGPT4 came out. And I just want to take a quick moment to just sort of give my observa observations about what I've seen uh, in the industry since it's come out. Uh, when it first came out, obviously it was very impressive. Um, we obviously have to rethink the Turing test. Um, Turing test, for those don't, that don't know, is like if you were closed off in a room by yourself and you were communicating on the other side of the wall, would you be able to know whether or not you're communicating with a human or a computer? So for the longest time, you know, you couldn't pass the Turing test. Um, computers are all just ones and zeros, binary. And, you know, there's a lot of if-else conditions. And, and you can make the argument that even the, the greatest of natural language processing that we have now and generative AI is a very complicated uh, if-else condition, basically. Um, so the thing is, um, is when you have massive amounts of computing power and you have massive, massive amounts of data that was acquired, you know, who knows, probably scraped on the Internet, uh, sourced from books and all the written literature throughout humanity. And when you're able to compile and, and just massively iterate over that data, it turns out you can guess the, the, the next right word um, quite effectively. So since these revolutions have been made, we definitely now have to rethink the Turing test because it's not going to be too long before we're not going to know whether or not we're communicating with a with a computer or not. Some could make the argument that we already don't we already don't know. But um, personally speaking, I feel like if I had a deep enough intellectual enough conversation with a uh, generative AI chatbot that I would be able to figure it out pretty quickly even now. I mean, some of the stuff was definitely a little bit hyped up, like, hey, write me a poem in Old English or something like that, or in the way that the Bible's written, however you'd want to phrase that. But um, so it wasn't really practical. And then we started seeing what it could do with code, and it could actually generate code. I also saw use cases of the chatbot recommending logos, company names, domain names. People were talking about projects that could spin up just from chat GPT. So yeah, when I first jumped on the chat GPT-4 when it first came out, and this is when everybody was hyping it up, when everybody, because the, the argument started to get, after a lot of people started using it, the argument was like, oh, you know, they're starting to nerf the thing, and, and it's not as effective as it used to be, and all this. I'll get to that more later, but I happened to ask it about a historical event in United States history, military history, that um, I happen to know a lot about, and it's sort of like a, I'm, a, I'm a history nerd, so I, I just like to kind of read that sort of stuff. I read a lot of nonfiction, uh, but history is one of my, my go-tos. And, and this battle is, uh, is fascinating. There's so many different ways that you could look at it. Uh, but it's by far like, well, maybe not by far, but it's, it's certainly up there as one of the most uh, historical American defeats of all time. And it's a very controversial topic and everything. But the bottom line is that it's a subject that I knew a lot about. And I asked ChatGPT4 about a particular, um, at the time he was a captain, I think, um, but it was uh, Frederick Benteen. And I asked uh, what had happened to him at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And it actually said that he died on Custer's Hill, like uh, Last Stand Hill. And that's incredibly inaccurate. It's not even close to being accurate. Um, and the point that I'm trying to make behind this is that, you know, guessing the, the, the next word is pretty amazing until it starts hallucinating. And if we transfer that concept over to code, we're seeing the same impressive level of stuff where it's like, hey, you know, try to do things this way and that way. And it, it writes a lot of code for you these days. So the industry's changed quite a bit in the fact that everybody should be using generative AI at this point. Whether it's uh, Copilot or ChatGPT or all of the above, everybody should be using it. It is a very nice tool to have, especially like when you're on a Friday afternoon, you got a deadline, you got a, a date later on that evening or whatever it might be, and, and you're stuck, you know, you're stuck and everybody's out of the office or you've already bothered people or like, you know, really sometimes when you drag people into your problem, it's going to... Uh, <laughs> You know, sometimes it's just like it, it's difficult to explain it. Now, that's one of the effective things of bringing somebody in is like you explain it and then sometimes you explain it to yourself. Uh, but a lot of times you can go and they're, they're just like, I have no idea, you know, try this or that. And that's essentially what ChatGPT is doing as well. 
Um, so, and especially with Copilot, I've noticed that Copilot very quickly gives up and it starts repeating like kind of the same things over and over again. And it's not smart enough to know like, hey, that's not working. This is the problem. Fix this problem. It's not smart enough to do that. And anybody that thinks that any generative AI, whether it's ChatGPT or Copilot or any of the other tools that we have out there, if they think that it's good enough to write all their code, then I'm sorry to say you're probably not working on anything that's uh, overly complex. Now, in addition to that, there's also the new and upcoming languages. So something like this, you know, these tools that we're now using, they're going to hurt up, up and coming languages. Well, you know, even things like probably, um, you know, Rust or you know, F sharp or a lot of the, the languages out there that don't have a lot of documentation they're pretty much going to be dead in the water here pretty soon because it's like, well, why would we want to learn that when there's, when chat GPT can't help me with it? Cause there's not enough code to guess the next right word. So there's two ways that you could look at that. One is that it's going to stifle innovation, especially in programming. And then the other way to look at it is that maybe we finally have a centralized way of communicating across the board because anybody that's been in this industry for a while knows that, you could write something that works on Microsoft and it don't work on Mac or Linux or, or vice versa. And then sometimes, you know, it obviously doesn't work on the same set of software, like um, just across different operating units and, or uh, yeah, operating systems and even just like different versions of operating systems. It's a nightmare, right? Nobody speaks the same language. If there's some new feature, some new ECMAScript standard or something, it takes forever for browsers to implement it. They all do it a little bit differently. And we've come together quite a bit over the years on that problem. But that's why tools like jQuery and all that sprung up because we needed a centralized way of writing something once and having it work. And that's always been a central root problem of programming. So the, the, the second way of looking at it on the positive side is that, hey, it's not going to stifle innovation. It's going to create all kinds of new opportunities because we're going to be able to finally basically speak the, the, the same language. And it would seem that that same language is probably going to be the English language. So like ASCII and all that other stuff that, that came long ago, the next programming language may very well be the English language to write all the code. Who knows about that? But essentially though we're gonna probably kind of go down into like a one way of getting something done but i've said long ago on this channel like you know we're still in web-based technology we're still using languages that were written on top of c um decades ago we're still using using this the same set of you know a few browsers that exist out there we still don't have like any new revolutionary way uh, of consuming content or creating something better than what we have. So generative AI and ChatGPT can definitely, if there's enough of a sample size, can allow us to speak the same language, be much more productive and get a lot of stuff done. But are we really innovating, right? Innovation has always come from humans. So we're now at this crossroads where we're going to rely on these tools and I, I've already seen it. I've seen it with myself. And we're relying on these tools already way too much. I guess my concern in regards to that is that it will ultimately stifle innovation if we're not actually working on something new, something better. That also brings me to the point of these tools are great, but sometimes we become so reliant on them that when they're not actually able to provide, like I've gone down the rabbit hole on generative AI many times where it's like, hey, try this, try that, try this, oh, make a change here, make a change here. Like, and then I'm just like, I'm tired, I'm trying to get it done. I'm like, okay, this thing knows what it's talking about. And then I get into like, sometimes like I just wasted an hour going down a rabbit hole of writing some code that, that I should have never wrote. Like, and I would have never written it if I would have just, you know, put my mind to it and figured out the problem in front of me. But programmers are lazy we always look for the easiest way to do things that's the way it should be unless maybe you're talking about generative ai because it can actually sometimes write some very sloppy code and sort of code you into a corner and 
even more so than copying and pasting code, which a lot of programmers have done. And, you know, some will say, well, that's not programming. It's always been a part of programming. But even when it comes to, um, to something like that, like this is a, at a whole new level of like copying code that you have no idea what it's doing. So, yeah, in a year and a half of this generative AI being out, everybody wants a chat bot. Everybody's putting it in every sort of product. It definitely saves a ton of time when I'm trying to write like a cover letter or, uh, you know, a lot of different tasks, really. But it, it doesn't it doesn't excel, in my opinion, at like game engines. So if I'm working on a VR game in Unreal Engine, it knows about some things, but it's it's definitely not very helpful. It's not helpful with some of the newer languages, definitely the newer technology, keeping up to date with the latest stuff. And then it also hallucinates. It hallucinates with its own code. And I would never want to give it up. Like it's now an, an integral, integral part of web and any sort of development that you're going to do. Pretty much every industry is going to be affected by this. But when it comes down to it, we might be hurting ourselves creatively.